I know you've got a cold, but uh, have you ever tried these zinc lozenges? The zinc? Do you try it? Do you like the no, zinc? Is that real? Is, are you just putting metals in I'm, your body? I am totally serious. Well, they, they, uh, the, the brand name is Coldies, but Cheapy, Cheapy McCheapskate over here goes to Walgreens and just gets the generic zinc lozenges. <laughs> gets like a block of zinc and shakes off some and... Because Ryan, if there's Ryan, if there's one thing you want to save money on, it's the metals you put in your body. <laughs> well, you I'm not like giving discount a, zinc. I'm not, I'm not giving <laughs> big zinc uh, uh, all that money. They've got big enough. Big zinc. <laughs> <laughs> but no, I swear to God, I was you know we got this bad flu that's going around right now, and I woke up and it just hit me like a ton of bricks, and I and my my head felt thick and 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 I was you know, coughing and sneezing, and I didn't want to get sick. And I went to the drugstore and picked up, again, the, the brand name is called these, but you can just get zinc. You start, they're like a little cough drop. And you pop these like every couple hours or so. And it literally had my cold gone in within 24 hours. I have a question, which is yes. how long has this been sponsored by Coldy's Zinc Tablets? <laughs> <laughs> uh, I like I like how in the context of, of, of a comics conversation, how it sounds like Brad's over here going, Hey, Ryan, you tried uh, Polonium 210? It's, uh, it's amazing for cold. <laughs> tried uh, Uranium 238? It's an amazing substitute for, uh, for rest. You just... Yeah, it'll, it'll make your eyeballs melt out of your head, but you won't have a cold. What is funny about modern medicine and the cold, because they can't figure out the, you know, the shifting nature of a cold, how there still is a little bit of snake oil salesman in, oh. in our Western medicine with just basic colds. Like, yeah. oh, no, what you want to do is you want to crack an egg into a cup and then pour a little bit of zinc on top of that egg uh-huh. and, then, and then fry that. And then what you want to do is put a little, put a little olive oil, but it's got to be virgin olive oil. <laughs> That'll get rid of your cold. <laughs> Listen... In Canada, we just have healthcare, and so we don't worry about buying <laughs> wow! Oh, sure. Wow, yeah. what a low blow. <laughs> I'll rub it in. <laughs> wow. I mean, I'm, I'm glad you guys are exploring the value of discount zinc <laughs> on your health. <laughs> <laughs> and I wish you the Boy, best. Ryan, Ryan really going for the jugular on us, Brad. Whoa. That's amazing. Holy cats. Next thing he's going to say is like, you know, and we also have a functioning executive branch. So uh, that's uh, everything's going right up here. You want to see two grown men cry, Ryan? Because you're, you're getting really close. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, the zinc will help your mood. Uh, yeah, <laughs> yes, it will. Please. Hi, everybody, and welcome to Comic Lab, <laughs> the show about making comics. And making a living through comics. I'm Brad Geiger, editor of webcomics.com and cartoonist of Evil Inc., and I'm Dave Kellogg, cartoonist of Drive and Sheldon and co-director of Stripped. And this week's Hour of Comics Advice is made possible by your support at patreon.com slash comic lab. And Dave, you get the pleasure this week of announcing that that third voice. Those dulcet Canadian tones with the with the with the quiet uh, little attack on our, our health care, lack of health care. I get it. It's Ryan North, everybody's favorite. You know him from Dinosaur Comics, from Squirrel Girl from ryannorth.ca and from a billion other projects involving making Shakespeare better. Yes. That's uh, another way to look at it. But also, Ryan, we want you to talk about howtoinventeverything.com, the first book I know of that springboarded off of a t-shirt, which I think is the brilliant <laughs> genesis of, of, of an entire book. Yes. <laughs> yeah. It, uh, well, the, the whole idea is that, you know, I've often worried that if I was sent back in time, how useless I would be. <laughs> and it's true. Like I'd be like, oh, if you can sit me down in front of a computer, I could tell you how to make a cool web page, but I couldn't tell you how to build a computer from scratch. Yeah. And so this book was me uh, researching it and figuring out how to, you know, reinvent civilization from first principles and shrink that down into 400 pages. As, as, a, as a genesis of an idea, because this is interesting, when all of us come up with ideas, we have to say, like, how could I express this to the world? And it is actually an interesting idea. I know I said it jokingly, but it is interesting that your first thought was, well, I'm not going to write a book about this, but I'll put it on a T-shirt. <laughs> <laughs> the T-shirt took a week of research, and the book took two years. So if you're going to go back in time, I'd recommend the book. It's, it's more complete. <laughs> uh-huh. 
<laughs> so you're saying you're saying I can get more out of a 200 page book than I can off of an 11 by 12 printing on a T-shirt? I'm not convinced. I don't. Know <laughs> Sell me on this, North. <laughs> Ryan, you're you're walking a hard road here with me. I don't know about this. So now, how how far into the book about like reinventing all of our uh, culture and society? How how many pages in did you go before you found the healing properties of zinc in the pages of How to <laughs> Yeah, I better see a chapter on zinc when I get this book. There is actually a chapter on uh, inventing medicines from, from scratch, but it does not include zinc. It is an oversight in my book, and I apologize. There's not a zinc <laughs> chapter. Most of the uses of zinc are in chemicals. By the way, you do not need to apologize for not kowtowing to, to carnival barker or snow <laughs> or snake oil salesman. <laughs> Step right up, step right up. Shake for your throat. You wait, gonna you wait you. Kellett. Next time you get a sore throat, you're going to be reaching for the zinc lozenges. I don't have <laughs> zinc in my house in lozenge form. <laughs> I tell you, you got to buy it in bulk. You got to get it in brick form like Brad does. With a little cheese grater. A right. little cheese grate that zinc right off. That'll That's the way to do it. You got to cut that shit on the bias. Get the good, the good cut on that zinc. <laughs> So two years of research, what does that involve? You basically have to get become a tiny bit of a specialist in uh, 40 different fields. Yeah, yeah, it, uh, it is a lot of work. Um, the, the fun of it is that there's a lot of, of low-hanging fruit that, you know, we don't think about, but it's, it's actually not that tricky. So there is actually a chapter on how to invent computers in the book. <laughs> really? And you, you get a functional engine at the end of it. And and the 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 computer at the is it Watergate's or what is it? Yeah, it's Watergate's. I know you knew about Watergate's. Well, uh, Nixon was a, a terrible president, and so I. <laughs> wow. uh, hey, oh, <laughs> look at me! <laughs> bing bong bing. No, I I must. You must have told me about this at breakfast. I think you told me about this at breakfast. In I assume in all Seattle. your knowledge comes from me. So I will well, say yes. I will say this. I'm excited for you as a friend that there is a sort of uh, real world joy in knowing all these little tidbits that, frankly, you'll never use, but are kind of f amazing that you got to suss them out and how they came about. Isn't that kind of what it's like to be a cartoonist is to gather up all this useless knowledge and then find a place for it? That's wow. If you were to bring the show to a, a denouement, Brad, that was it right there. All right, everybody. Thanks for <laughs> well, listening. I always denouement early. <laughs> <laughs> That's, uh, well, listen, we've talked to your wife about that, and we, she's she's just come to peace with it, Brad. Your denouement has come early, and that's all right. Um, I like how Ryan stayed away from that one. He's like, I'm I not know, touching we, that. He just, it's between him and his wife. I mean, I, I, I would hesitate to call, like, here's how to make a functioning farm trivia. I think it'd be useful if you were stuck in the past. <laughs> <laughs> yes. No. Absolutely. Absolutely. So, what was uh, what was the one that stands out to you the most, either in terms of its genesis as an idea or uh, its uh, execution in its first attempts? Which one, which one stands out to you the most? If you look at the compass, which is a very simple invention, and all you need for the compass is magnets, and those are not that hard to find. Actually, you can make them yourself with hair and just a little piece of metal, not zinc, but you have some iron lying around. You can make a magnet. <laughs> <laughs> and this, this invention, we had the materials for it since antiquity, but it, we didn't start using it for navigation until around 1000 AD. And so it's it's a huge amount of time we're just sitting around not inventing compasses. <laughs> and the more you look at history, the more you see there's a lot of stuff like that, <laughs> where in retrospect, we weren't the shiniest pennies in the fountain. <laughs> Uh, no, so absolutely. Sorry. <laughs> that, like, like right, no, but right now, a uh, hundred years from now, they'll be like, "Why didn't they invent this in, in 2018? What, what the Why heck? Why were they swallowing I, 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 zinc I, I, to help with the sore throat?" <laughs> 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 well, no, you don't. Want I, to, I don't know about zinc. It might actually be you, a cure. You don't want to swallow it. You suck on it. If you swallow it, it's going to get caught in your throat. <laughs> Nobody wants that. Oh, for God's sakes! It's like he went to medical school <laughs> about the zinc. <laughs> So, uh, so I, I got to ask you, because I don't know that I've ever asked you this initial question, is that how did you first dip a toe into wanting to, because you're an incredible writer, but how did you first dip a toe into wanting to get into comics specifically? Uh, I had loved comics since I was a kid, but like, theoretically, I loved comics because you couldn't read comics. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I lived in a, a small town, there was no internet. And so, you know, I, I knew of things like Superman and Batman through just like cultural osmosis, but... I couldn't go and buy a comic at the comic store because there wasn't one in the village I lived in. And so when I got a job out of high school, 
my first paycheck, I walked into a comic book store downtown in the big city of Ottawa and just bought some books at random. And I was like, oh, I do like comics. Great. I always suspected I did. <laughs> and then it's it's a very short road from from liking to read comics to wanting to write them, right? Mm-hmm. Well, for us, I don't know that that's true for everybody, but yes, I will grant you that for for a chunk, a big chunk of the comics reading public, that that is true. Yes, yes. I don't know why I was going to fight you on that. <laughs> no, Ryan. <that's> not- <laughs> the, the funny thing about it was, that it took me a long time to realize that you could make comics without being able to draw. Like it's it's a collaborative medium most of the time. But I was and still am big into indie comics where one person does it all. Yeah. And I was like, well, I, I can't draw, so I'm I'm stuck. Like I can't do comics. There's no such thing as a comics writer. And uh, that's that's where dinosaur comics came from. Where it's the same pictures with different words. It was my hack to uh, get around not being able to draw. And had you ever been uh, aware before of uh, what do they call it, Brad? The Italian comics where it's the photo comic. Fumetti. Fumetti. There we go. For God's sakes, there it is. That's 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 what I was looking for. So did you? Were you aware of Fumetti and that kind of thing before you? No. Um, no. no, so you not at all. So, I thought the only comic I knew of on the on the internet was Aquid, and I thought I was going to be the second comic on the internet. It was going to be <laughs> that's nice amazing. Comics. What I love though about this process is because I I do love this when this happens is never having heard of Fumetti, you're essentially like the guy on the opposite end of Europe inventing calculus independently. Yeah. Like you basically yeah. independently yeah. invented Fumetti in your own mind and in your own life, uh, which is kind of amazing. Well, it worked out well because I found out a couple months into it about David Lynch's college comic called The Angriest Dog in the World. And that was always the same three pictures of this very angry dog tied up outside a house. And the dog never spoke. And it was just basically a lot of puns. They were great. Like, you'd have this dog. Always the same narration in the first panel about this dog being so angry that he approaches a state of rigor mortis because he's so bound with with rage. (laughs) And then the second panel is just the dog there. And the third panel, the house in the background, a voice bubble comes out and says, why is it all San Andreas's fault? (laughs) <laughs> that sort of stuff. But had I known about that comic, I would have never started Dinosaur Comics because I'd, it would have felt like it was the same thing. Right. And it's not the same thing. And I've gotten past the idea I had as a, as a team that everything has to be fully whole cloth original to be have any value. But at the time, if I'd known that someone had tried making comics with the same pictures over and over and over again, I'd be like, well, that's done. There's nothing more for me to do here. Yeah. And I would probably still be working in computers. Programming wow. computers. We have your ignorance to thank for your entire <laughs> career. This is great. Yeah. You're not unique in that respect. There's been a lot of careers based on <laughs> ignorance. <laughs> Mine, for example. Yeah, that's that. You you do not walk that road alone. That that's good. So well, let me ask you this because this is an interesting question now for for people further along in their career. And Brad, I would like to get your thoughts about this. Is how much do you reject an idea now if it's not whole cloth different from something that has come before? I mean, I still do a lot of the time. <laughs> I it's. It's something I struggle with, right? Because nobody wants to be a plagiarist. And that line is kind of fuzzy mm-hmm. sometimes. And the the hard line of that is I will only do stuff that I, I believe is wholly original. And it's not super sustainable, especially when you start looking more at what originality is. And that becomes very fuzzy because we're all going off influences. We're all speaking a language that we didn't invent, but borrowed from our parents. And they didn't invent it either. Like this idea of a, a lone genius inventing things whole cloth is very hard to aspire to or even have in reality. That said, often when I look at starting a project, I'll Google it. And if someone has done it, I think, oh, great, I don't have to do that. Uh, To be or not to be the choose your own (laughs) path Shakespeare. I looked that up before writing and I had this instant when the page was loading thinking, if this is done, I don't have to write it, which will be great. I'll just get to read it and enjoy it. It'll be fun. (laughs) And then it wasn't (laughs) done and I had to write it. (laughs) So there's, there's still a large part of that of wanting to be if not new, then then novel. I think. Yeah. Right. Right. I, I can understand that, Brad. What's your th- what's your th- angle on that? When you have an idea that springs to you, how much of it has to be new or whole cloth, and how much you're like, well, I mean, somebody did this in the 20s, but this is a totally different take on this. Well, it, it, for me, I I kind of am, or at least I feel the same as Ryan. I don't know how good I am at implementing it, but I but when I'm writing, for example, for Evil Inc. I, I want that idea to come from me. I, I don't want to rely on using a, a joke I heard or using uh, a, a reference to somebody else or something like that. And that's not to say that I don't sprinkle that in here and there, like references and, and so forth. But, but I want my work 
overall to be something that comes from me. And I was actually kind of just this morning thinking about maybe it would have been better if I didn't have that, uh, specifically in the genre of dad jokes. In other words, I've got a huge repository of what people now would say is a dad joke. And I, if I would have started back in 2000 or 2001 doing dad jokes, number one, it would have been easier because it is, it's not, this isn't something that you make up on your own. It's, it's a dad joke, right? But it is so, it, you see that reference thrown so much and so popular. I almost wonder whether from a business standpoint, it wouldn't have been better for me to just say, oh, you know what? I'm just going to do dad jokes. For example, on Instagram, I've been, I've been sharing with you, Dave, my difficulty in getting, getting traction on Instagram. I, I heard a great dad joke and basically put the camera up to my face, recited the dad joke. It is, I think, still the most retweeted, commented on uh, thing that I've <laughs> ever put up on Instagram. It, 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 and it's a stupid little joke. I think it would have been a lot better for me to have done dad jokes than to have tried to do something original. But at the end of the day, the original stuff is more challenging and is more rewarding when you actually... Uh, connect with it. Yeah, and there's probably a ceiling on the number of on where dad jokes can take you if you're trying to build a career yeah. out of, you know, lazy puns that only gets you so far. <laughs> well, I don't know. I've gotten pretty far with lazy puns. Not to disparage your dad jokes. I haven't seen it. That's amazing. So the the thing that the the one thing uh, Ryan that I found interesting about the way you answered that was if it if nothing comes up when I Google this, then I have to do it. And you use the word "have to" or "had to" twice when you yeah, describe that. Yeah. And I want to mm. ask you about that because that is that's borderline compulsion. And I'm not saying this in a negative <laughs> way. No, no, I'm not saying this in a negative way. But I want you to I want you to pick that apart a little bit. That what did you mean when you said if this doesn't come up, then I have to do it? Well, the the background there that I did didn't share is that I'm not going to reach the Googling this idea with interest stage unless I'm already I've already convinced myself that it's a good idea and I want to do it. Okay. So that's not compulsion. I don't think I've never been one of those writers who's like, ah, oh, my characters are speaking to me and I must get this down on the page. I'm compelled by a stronger force than my own. No, I'm, I'm, that's not me. There's a very rational answer to your good question, but I feel like it's kind of a dud answer. <laughs> I don't know. I <laughs> no, really do it when I'm committed. Right. No, I, that, that actually, that's a totally fair answer. But I wanted, I wanted just to, to explore that for a second because I found that verb very interesting that I have to yeah. do it. So in a way, once you've gotten to the point where you're Googling for possible pre-existing ideas, you're already making a pact with yourself that like, oh boy, I'm excited. Are we excited? We're excited. Yes, we're going to do this. We're going to do this. All right, let's Google it. All right. If it, if it come, doesn't come up though, we got to do it. All right. All right. Yes, we got to. I mean, is that, what is that? Uh, what is the step right before you type in Shakespeare, choose your own adventure into Google? Uh, I, I do love that window into your own internal dialogue where it's a bunch of people sitting around <laughs> building each other up. <laughs> Those are just the voices in his head. <laughs> it's a lot of self chatter over here. There you know sure what? Is. Are we doing great? We're doing great. We're doing great. We're enjoying this coffee. We're having a good day. Having a good day. It's funny, per, to be or not to be in particular, uh, I was actually driving home from my parents. It was a three hour drive. And I was in the car, a little convoy with my brother in front, and uh, this was back in the day. So it was, I guess, it was 2011. Anyway, texting cost money. And we had walkie talkies left over, so we were on the walkie talkies between these two cars. <laughs> and I had the idea in the car. I was thinking of the Hamlet's to be or not to be speech and how it was structured like a choice. And then I was like, oh my god, a choice like those old choose your own adventure books, and you could have instead of a play within a play, a book within a book, and you have choosable characters. And it just building in my head as I'm driving getting very excited about it. And then I, you know, I introduced the walkie talkies to the store. We didn't actually use them. Forget the walkie talkies. I met my <laughs> brother at a rest stop and I talked about it there. And wow. then when I got home, I Googled it. But that was after three hours of making, this is so cool. And talking to another human, not just the voices in my head saying, this is so cool. Yeah. So I, in that situation, I had built myself up for three hours of wanting to do it. So that was a little unusual. The car as a setting is an interesting question, and it actually raises another question I want to ask you, which is how you capture your ideas, because the car, and Brad can probably chime in on this too, the car is both the best friend and the worst friend in terms of generating ideas, because, if it, and it's different than a plane or a train or a bus, because when you're actively driving, you're, you're engaging a big chunk of your conscious mind on keeping yourself alive and keeping yourself on the yeah. road. And so there's a, there's a freedom for your creative side of your brain to, to 
to freeform ideas and to, to experiment. But the downside is you cannot capture your ideas when you're driving. And so I'm curious, Ryan, how far into that process did you get where you, before you went, all right, when I pull over for gas, I got to write this down or, or do you do that kind of thing? Uh, I didn't because I was so excited about the idea that I knew I wasn't going to forget about it. Like we've all had ideas, especially like just before bed and you have a great idea for comic and you're like, oh, I'm going to remember that in the morning. And all you remember is thinking you had a good idea and it's gone forever. Yeah. But right. for that, I was so excited about the idea that, and the basics came to me so quickly. If there wasn't, there wasn't teasing this apart. It's like, oh yeah, this, this is how this will, will look. This is how this book will play. It's all there. It was sort of a, the closest I've had to an idea arriving fully formed. Yeah. And so it was just a matter of uh, connecting the dots. But normally I do worry about forgetting stuff all the time. I remember hearing an anecdote about the Beatles in which Paul McCartney said that they refused to write things down. Like, like even like if a tune came into their head, he and John Lennon kind of had a standing deal that they didn't write that down because they said if it was good enough to really do, if it was really that good, they wouldn't forget it. And if they had forgotten it, then it must not have been very good. Oh, that, I disagree. I've forgotten so many good comics late at night. <laughs> <laughs> I thought that was kind of interesting in how it dovetailed with what you said, though. Like you said, this was such a good thing. I knew I wasn't going to forget it. For those keeping track at home, that was Ryan North shit talking Paul McCartney and Paul and John Lennon. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I, uh, you no know, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. Come on. They've written some good tunes, right? <laughs> <laughs> Although I would like, if we were giving advice to a person starting out web comics, uh, of course I would say, yes, you want to carry a notebook and write things down. But, but there is that element sometimes. And I think that's what you were describing where you get an idea that it's just so good that you know that you're not going to have to write this one down. This is going to stay with you. Right. Mm -hmm. Right. And also, I, I was stuck in a car, so. You know what, though, to answer Ryan's point now with a serious thought instead of me being jokey, um, <laughs> one thing that's interesting about Paul and John and the Beatles is that, and this is not necessarily being negative about the, the, what they do, but a musician, when you're at that level, at best, you're putting out two albums a year, so 20 to 30 songs, is a very different output than what a cartoonist does day in, day out. That's true. You know what I mean? So so we have to capture a bigger volume of ideas than Paul and John would have had. Listen to, 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 I don't know why I keep going back to Paul and John, sorry. But anyway, <laughs> but like a, a cartoonist has a greater volume of things that we just need to get down on a page, I think, than a musician does. Is that, a, a, is that something worth considering or am I off on the wrong track there? Well, as a non-musician, uh, I say that sounds great. <laughs> <laughs> that's all i want in life is the validation from Ryan. Right. so now listen ryan when, when we're talking about you you googled to see if there had been other shakespeare choose your own adventure books here's a, here's a question that immediately came to mind what if you found one but it wasn't that good and it was like it, it would it, it would would that have still have dissuaded you from doing it um i'd have to be able to tell that it wasn't that good from the website because I wouldn't want to buy the book and read it because I'd be worried about polluting my own precious brain. Right. No, that I can't. And uh, if I could tell that this was structurally different, because To Be or Not To Be was, I think it was 700 pages. It was a thick, thick book with a lot of different choices. And most nonlinear second person narratives are around 50 pages. They're, they're short books. And so those two things are, are different, right? I was not trying to write down for kids. I was trying to write for all ages, this full wide adventure in Hamlet. So if they were significantly different, I could tell, then I would probably still do it. But if I couldn't, I'd be like, oh, it's probably good. I think I'm good. I'm fine. I yeah. might read it and then decide, you know what, it can be done better. But I can't think of a single instance in which I've done that. Mm -hmm. Unless you count, you know, reading superhero comics and then basically reinventing squirrel girl but that didn't feel like that either so another shrug answer from ryan over here <laughs> no 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 so uh, let's 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 unpack that how did that feel differently because that's actually where i was leading in my earlier question was squirrel girl you have an entire 
body that, if anything, suffers from having so many different versions of itself that there are special people that have to track things for Marvel and DC. So let me ask you that. How did, how did Squirrel Girl differ in the idea that before you're like, well, if someone's done it, then, I, then I, it's, it's not for me to do. But here is Squirrel Girl where there's been a billion different versions of Marvel's villains, superheroes, character settings, and you're stepping into that. How did you approach that differently than you would have approached, say, How to Invent Everything or Hamlet or, you know, Dinosaur Comics? Well, the difference there is that Squirrel Girl had never had her own ongoing comic before. She never starred in a comic before. She had a true, handful of true. appearances yeah, in the years no, before absolutely. then, and I could, I could sit down and read them all. Like, it did not take long to read all the Squirrel Girl content in the universe. <laughs> it was <laughs> yeah. less than a day to read it all. And so uh, the way that worked is that I got an email from my editor, Will, saying, hey, hypothetically, if there were to be a Squirrel Girl comic, um, what, what would it look like? What would you do with that? And I was like, Squirrel Girl? Uh, she's the, the squirrel one, right? Like, <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> but I took the weekend. I read, all, I read all about her, which didn't take that much time, and thought about her. And by the end of the weekend, I knew that I really wanted her to be a Squirrel Girl comic, and I really wanted to be the guy writing it. And what attracted me to it was here's a chance to do something that is all ages E, like anyone can read accessible, but in this, this larger Marvel universe that has this, you know, 60 years of unbroken narrative history there. And the secret I did, the, the smooth move was in my pitch. I pitched it, I pitched it as something that someone who hasn't been reading Marvel comics for all that time could still read and still enjoy. It would be accessible. You go into it cold. You'd know what's going on. We introduce everything. Yes. Yes. And, the reasons that I didn't have that Marvel knowledge, that depth of Marvel knowledge to dwell on. If you look at who she fights in the first couple issues, they've all been in the movies. <laughs> I was like, oh, yes. <laughs> I know Galactus. Well, Galactus and Craven are exceptions because I like them. But like, I was going off of sort of general ambient Marvel knowledge and not that depth of Marvel knowledge. I have it now because I, I get to read a bunch of comics for free. So I'm like, yes, <laughs> send me more comics. <laughs> I read them all. But it felt more like here's a character who's been around and she's had sort of background stuff and a couple starring roles, but no issue about her. When you take a character that's been a supporting character and make her a main character, stuff changes, right? Uh, now she's got her own supporting cast. Now she's got her own universe. What's she doing? Where, where is she? What are her goals? What, who is she really? And it felt like all of that was up for grabs. So it's kind of this chance to make a new character based off the bones of what came before, which is basically, I think everything, Whenever you're writing a superhero comic, you're taking over the character from someone else and you're going to to make some changes to make that character more interesting, to make the best version of the character you can write, which will be different than the best version of the character someone else can write. And so, you know, people talk about, you know, so-and-so's run on the X-Men versus another team is run on the X-Men and how they're different, right? I, I love Magneto when he's written by this person. And so for comics fans, there's a sense of character plus creative team equals what you like. And so because of that, it felt very natural to be like, okay, this will be the Ryan North and Erica Henderson Squirrel Girl revamp, and we'll see where that takes us. But it's, it's very freeing to know that you're not the first person to write this character. You're not going to be the last person to write this character. You're the steward of this character for some time. And if you're lucky, you can put a mark on her so that people will think of what you did with her when they think of the character. You become the, the, the defining role for at least a little while. Yeah. And it's basically all you can hope for. Well, no, I, I have to say, because um, I, maybe I didn't lead with this, is, and I've told you this personally, though, in our house and in our family, we absolutely adore what you have done with Squirrel Girl. It is, it's fun. It's joy-filled. It's optimistic. Thank um, you. It's, it's everything that I remember as a kid from the more standalone stories, if, if that makes sense, uh, of with comics mm -hmm. where uh, you're, you're in, you're out, and you've had a great time. And maybe the character advanced a little bit. Maybe there's a little overall world building for each one. But they are, and collectively, you get this great arc uh, across, you know, five, six, seven books. But each one is a, is a delight to read. And um, I think you have, you have played such a delicate and wonderful hand with that book, and I'm so glad to see all the accolades that have come your way for it because it's very well deserved. Uh, thank you. Please continue. This is great. <laughs> <laughs> I, like the, I like the awkward pause. There. That was great. Uh, well, so, but, but let me ask you this. When you, when you write for I Marvel, there might be some more. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> I, uh, when you write for Marvel though, how is it different for you both in terms of idea generation and in execution 
how how differently do you self edit when you are writing for Marvel than when you write for Ryan or a project that's just you? Yeah, um, it's interesting. I was talking to uh, Randy Monroe about this a while back. He does X- XKCD, and we were saying like, how do you when you're not working with an editor, where do you draw the line? And he told me that very early on, he put the worst swear word he was willing to put in his work into a comic <laughs> to be like, this is the line, <laughs> this is the word I will say, and no further. I thought that was really interesting. Uh, with Dinosaur Comics, we look back at the earlier ones. Uh, T Rex cusses more, uh-huh. or uh, this was sort of. This, I think you might even see like an individual comic where I realize that the word frig is way more funnier yeah. <laughs> than the alternative. Like a minced oath has so much more potential than just a straight swear word. Oh wait, can I pause you? You just used a phrase I've never heard. Did you say a minced oath? A minced oath. Yes. Yeah, yes. I've never heard that phrase. What is that? Yeah. Um, it. I don't think. I, I studied linguistics, so it might be a technical term, but it might not be. Uh, the idea of a minced oath is instead of saying, I'm not going to say the bad word because this is a family-friendly show, I presume. Right. But instead of saying, uh, say, Jesus Christ, which you might think is a, is a bad word or something you shouldn't take his name in vain, you could say, Jesum, Cheesum. Or cheese and rice. Or cheese and rice, or something where you've taken the oath and you've cut it up or minced it to make a different thing that isn't technically a swear, but we clearly know what you're getting to. Along the same lines as mincing words. Yeah. But as a, as a phrase, I love the yeah. idea that it's a minced oath because I, I had personally, I had forgotten that traditionally a lot of swear words were actually oaths. And uh, like you would say, God's blood or something like that was, yeah. was a, ver- a, a version of a, of a, of a oath. Um, and I'm just fascinated that that phrase still exists, minced oath, as a as a description of a swear word. Because so often we don't consider swear we we consider now swear words uh, an expression of pure emotion. Where back in the day they were oaths, mm. and that's fascinating that that still exists. I forgot that that was the case. So thank you for do 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 teaching me. That was great. <laughs> My, I think you'll find Dave that even the smallest words I use are fascinating. <laughs> and- <laughs> <laughs> oh my goodness what have i done in complimenting See, I, ryan brad oh no <laughs> i let you finish your compliments to me i start and you just start laughing as soon as they're complimenting myself it's a whole different ball game i as i'm complimenting ryan he's just swelling up like the girl that's a blueberry in uh <laughs> willy Wonka over there and now and now i've, I've got to slowly deflate that blueberry like an oompa loompa <laughs> There's one thing I'd like to come back to, and that is Ryan talked about mm-hmm. the idea of not wanting to pollute his brain by reading other things that might be similar. Dave, do you ever do that? Because that's kind of, that's familiar ground for me. I find myself avoiding other things that are similar to what I'm working on because I don't want to even subconsciously plagiarize that stuff. So I, I tend to avoid it. Do you, do you do the same? Well, I will say this, because this might be a version of your question. So I am a huge lover of sci-fi, as you both know. I And I so mm-hmm. Drive for me is my great love at the moment. I'm really enjoying writing it because for me, it's kind of, every once in a while you stumble into a project where you're like, oh, this is everything I like. It's sci-fi, it's humor, it's character building, it's serious, it's goofy, it's, you know, it's a lot of different things. But anyway, so I grew up reading and watching a lot of sci-fi. But now if somebody tells me something like, oh boy, I'm really enjoying Drive, it really reminds me of book XYZ. Have you read XYZ? What I will do is I will then avidly avoid book XYZ yeah. because I don't want that to influence or color how I'm writing. Like if, if, if by accident, kind of like Ryan independently inventing Fumetti, if by accident I've independently stumbled <laughs> on the same idea that book XYZ has, has come up with, yeah. I don't want to further it by cementing it in the back of my brain. And I'll tell you why, because there was one moment early in my career where Rich Stevens I had not met him, and I had only just seen some of his comics online. But about six months later, Mm -hmm. as sometimes happens, one of his comics, and this was about 15 years ago, 10 years ago, something like that. It was a long time ago. But one of his comics germinated in my brain. And then in my mind's eye, six months later, I thought I had self-created an idea, which was, in fact, (laughs) just a a regurgitation of of an idea that I had read in Rich. And so I know that my brain has the capacity to take in an idea stew on it, forget where it came from, and then independently think that it's it's mine. And so I have to be mm-hmm. careful when someone says, oh, hey, Drive reminds me of book XYZ. Why don't you try it? And I have to go, no, 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 because I know that happened once with a Rich Stevens comic, and by God, I'm going to do everything I can to never do that again. What I'm, what I'm hearing from this, Dave, is that you don't read dinosaur comics because you're afraid you'll, you'll steal 
all those great ideas I put in it. Well, Ryan, and you know what? It's what's both funny? a continent and a bird. <laughs> what I what I will say to you is this: is that I came up with an idea one time for I don't even remember what the full joke was, but it was something to do with the song about um, what's the the snowman song where the where the Parson Brown comes in and and marries the Frosty the Snowman. It's, Frosty, it's Frosty, it's the most how famous many snowman, snowman songs. Are there, Dave? There's only wow. one snowman, you know snowman song. song? You it's know not like it's a whole you. genre. You know, from the, yeah, the body of work about snowmans, you know, the uh, the children's song, but there's uh, 40 of them to choose from. No, you're right. I, okay. I'm admitted, this is, you're seeing into problems with my brain. So, okay. So there, I did I did what I thought was a delightful Frosty the Snowman comic. And then I don't know how many months later I saw Ryan at a comic convention. And I think Ryan, you said, Hey, I did an almost identical version of this comic. And I went, Oh no, because I literally don't know if I saw yours or if, uh, if I, in- I hope to think that I came up with it independently and we were just like, Oh, well, it's some mm-hmm. great minds. But when you said it in a friendly tone, my gut dropped because I was like, No, it happened again. Did I do the thing that I did 10 years ago? So, yes, Ryan, to answer your question, I don't read anything by anybody for that fear. <laughs> and any ideas I came up with are 100% mine. <laughs> And not taken from your dinosaur comics on December 23rd, 2010. There is kind of some truth to that in that I've stopped reading peer stuff because I don't want to be influenced by it. Yeah. So I'll read, I'll mm-hmm. read older stuff that came 20 or 30 years ago, but I, uh, there is truth to the fact that I don't read a lot of peer stuff because I don't want to accidentally stumble upon things, you know? Well, that's, I mean, I was guessing that's the secret to being a good writer in comics, but you said it incorrectly in my opinion so i will rephrase what you said <laughs> wow all right <laughs> <laughs> yeah fix cut it for us would you please well where i thought you were going was going to say not read stuff from 30 years ago but read stuff outside the medium so you can't be a great writer but if you want to write novels you can't just read novels you have to read other stuff oh. and the more you read stuff outside the medium you're working in the more you'll say oh that's interesting that documentary that cool thing that i can take yeah. and adapt because it's not the same thing it needs transformation to exist in this milieu but I can use that to make my own work better. And it's an inventive creative process that isn't just lifting. When you look in the same medium, you're going to be lifting because you've they've already done the translation for you, which is what I thought you were going to say. But reading old books is also good if you, it, there's a danger that your work will read like it is from the seventies, but <laughs> that's a risk. Um, I, I have to say, Ryan, that is a risk that I've consistently taken for 20 years. And so far <laughs> everyone has called me on it. <laughs> no, I, I was just going to say, because as important as it is to avoid the pollution of, of your mind, like Ryan was saying, it's also just as important to seek inspiration. It, yeah. It's important to seek inspiration from other sources. And I think sometimes we walk a fine line between trying not to uh, pollute our minds with stuff that's too similar, but yet to find inspiration in other creative endeavors. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and that's an interesting road to walk because for me with Drive, a big part of the tone of Drive is inspired by uh, Douglas Adams' Hitchhiker's Guide, but it's a very different book and a very different approach. But just the, the simple fact that he was able to marry straight up humor with what's ostensibly a, a, a long form sci-fi story, to me, I went, oh, okay, it can be done. But now I'm going to do it in a very different way. But I found the inspiration that he had even attempted it. Like a proof of concept. Yeah, a proof of concept. Thank you. Yes. Um, and so I, I see what you're saying, Brad, that sometimes even knowing that a thing could exist or could could be adapted to comics is in itself helpful, even if you take nothing from it. Right. <laughs> what? <laughs> what a great pause. Uh <laughs> <laughs> well, you had summed it up so well. I didn't want to. I didn't want to walk all over it. I was waiting for someone to compliment me, like I had complimented Ryan on Squirrel Girl. But that, you know, I'll I'll, I'll go to my grave waiting oh, on that. I guess. Well, hold on. I'll 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 edit this in. You know what, Dave? Uh, one thing I want to say about you: I really like Squirrel Girl. Ah, <laughs> <laughs> uh, what a delightful sob! All right, so, <laughs> Ryan. Ryan, one other idea I wanted to run past you because I'm curious how your mind does this sure. uh, is you now, well, not right now, but let's say six to 12 months ago, you were working on Squirrel Girl. You were working on how to invent everything. Um, you were working on um, short stories for different locations. Uh, you probably were working on one or two mm-hmm. other projects I'm not familiar with. But when yes. an idea, when a joke, when a concept jumps into your mind and it doesn't necessarily have a home, how do you sort what project to put that idea in? 
do you go, oh, this this great joke about, uh, I don't know, Galileo could go in Squirrel Girl, could go in Dinosaur Comics, could go in How to Invent Everything. Where do I put it? Yeah, um, for the longest time, everything went into Dinosaur Comics. And I would do this, this trick that Vonnegut would do with Kilgore Trout, where he would have an idea for a book and he'd just have the character of Trout write it and then he'd give a quick plot sum- summary of what would have happened and he doesn't have to write the book anymore. <laughs> and so T-Rex would do this all the time. Like Machine of Death is an anthology we did that came out of a dinosaur comic where I had this idea and I thought, T-Rex can talk about that. And then we actually did make it real after the fact. But So for the longest time, it was just, I'll have T-Rex talk about it at the end. Now with multiple projects, um, sometimes it has a home right away. I remember I was walking my dog Chomsky and I thought of... Uh, justice being spelt just ice. And I was like, oh, this can be a joke about Ice King making a hall of justice, but it's actually the hall of just ice. And it's a, it's a pun that takes a lot of scaffolding to get there, but I can do that in comics. So that goes into Bet Your Time right away. Uh, in other stuff, there have been, you know, Twitter jokes I've made that I then said, you know what, I'm going to put that into a comic. And that's kind of self plagiarism, but I operate under the assumption, which is also true, that Twitter is a lossy medium where if you don't check it for 12 hours, you're not going to scroll back and see what people are saying 12 hours ago. It's garbage now. Right. So I feel like a, a joke I do on Twitter, if I like it, I can put that into Dinosaur Comics and it's fine. It's not like I'm breaking the law. I'm fine with it. I'm, I'm not going to go to jail for this. <laughs> I think it's fine. <laughs> Squirrel Girl is different because she she's in the Marvel Universe and I haven't had a lot of ideas where I thought, you know, you know, if there was this uh, giant tuning fork purple hat guy that ate planets, I could do something with that and thinking, oh, no, I'll put that in Squirrel Girl. Like Galactus is already there and it fits there already. So there hasn't been a lot of conflict of where things go. It's more when you sit down to do the work, what can we do here with the parts that we have? Which makes it sound more more workmanlike than than moments of beautiful inspiration. Yeah. But it's a bit of both, I guess. But it also, I guess, on some level is instantaneously gut level. You're like, that one's for Squirrel Girl, that's for Dinosaur, that's for How to Invent Everything. Uh, where it's, a, it's a very quick sort in your mind just based on tone and setting. Is that is that a good way to say it? Yeah, yeah, pretty much. Um, some stuff will end up on Twitter. I, I did a post, a stupid post yesterday. I say stupid. I thought it was funny. Uh, it was a picture of a pill that says antibiotics and then a picture of yogurt that says probiotic and then the pill being dumped in the yogurt and then the earth exploding. <laughs> and I just had this in my head for a day. I'm like, I just, I got to write this out because I'm tired of thinking about it. <laughs> I don't think there's enough here to, to build an arc of squirrel girl around, but at least I got to make the joke. I, I was wondering whether I was the only person who feels that way. And I, I, that, that, I, I that's why I, I, exclaimed when you said that I, am I the only person that sometimes you just have to exercise an idea, it, whether it's a good idea or bad, it's just in your head and you know, it's going to be there until finally you do something with it and you can, it's like exercising a demon. It's like, all right, it's out. Now I can move on. Yeah. What I did, my, my mental trick was I decided that when I had something that were like, this is a silly joke. It's not, it's let's call it a dad joke. It's yeah. It's not that it's not going to change the world. So the rather than just saying, well, I posted, I'm done. I did the joke. It becomes, well, what's the best version of this? What's the almost like practice? How can I take this, this premise and make it as funny as possible? And so it's almost writing practice for that one. The experiment was, I'll just tell this joke with pictures. So the before images and that tells the story rather than saying, wouldn't it be funny if you put antibiotics, what happens if you put antibiotics in a probiotic yogurt? Does the earth explode? Like that, that doesn't work as well. The pictures that you make the connection yourself. So it's kind of homework in a way, but really it's just practice and exploring different ways to, to tell jokes, to tell stories, which is a very kind of arty way to talk about a Twitter post. <laughs> well, no, I actually, <laughs> but, I, I wanted to circle back around on that idea of self pla- self plagiarization because I find, uh, and I think my gut tells me that you will find the same is true. I find that Twitter is a wonderful, no stakes, easy to execute playground for ideas that you can then build on later in comics. And I'm always surprised when someone says, well, I tweeted it. I can't turn it into a comic. Because for me, that is almost the purpose of Twitter is a writing playground that I can see, you know, I can throw what sand I can together, see what makes a tower, and then, you know, turn that into something else in block form. Or, you know what I mean? In the sense that uh, it's impermanence and it's quicksilveriness allow it to be a great way to test out very quickly ideas that might otherwise take a couple hours to execute. And then whatever takes off on Twitter, I can go, all right, that's going to be a good comic. I, I did like that one. So we'll I'll make that into a comic. 
in on some levels, I've actually come to actively choose to try out ideas on Twitter to see what works. Yes. Yes. Um, rather than even worry about self plagiarization, like you had mentioned, for me now there are certain things that are so low stakes, i.e., Twitter, that I might as well try it out, kind of not A/B testing, but just sort of testing and seeing if I like an idea. Like I guess what I'm saying is, to Brad's idea of exorcising an idea, just getting it out into the world, seeing how much joy I got from it, seeing how much joy it brings other people, and then saying, do I want to spend one to four hours on this idea? You know. The phrase you put in my head with that was the idea that uh, journalism being the first draft of history and Twitter being the first draft of comedy, <laughs> where you can sort of get it out there, see what works, and then refine it. Yeah, well, in, in a way, hearing what you've said today, you very capably take ideas into a lower work impact setting first to see if you like them. So, for example, Machine of Death or How to Invent Everything went in through Dinosaur Comics first because that's lower impact before you said, okay, yes, I do want to spend a half a year on this. And in a way, that's a version of Twitter, you know, for me in terms of basic ideas. The idea of sorting ideas into a project that's manageable at first to see how many, how much sea legs it has before you, before you say, no, I'm going to spend two years on this. Because I think a lot of authors can go down the rat hole of time of like, the only way I know if this will work is if I spend a year on it. And then you're like, oh, hey, how'd that book come out that you're working on for the last year? Oh, it's a piece of shit. I, it's terrible. I'm not, <laughs> I'm not working on it. The luxury we have as people that work in cartooning is that there are some ideas that are very easy to execute in comics form that you can serve as a test bed for bigger projects. And I think there's genius to that in what you've done. Absolutely. I think the core of this is that one of the things, again, going back to Rich Stevens, who I guess is the, the center of all <laughs> our lives, very early on, we were talking about ideas. And he told me, you should never worry about running out of ideas. You always have another idea. And for a while, I was kind of precious about my ideas, where I thought, like, you know, this is the last good idea I'll have. And if I talk about it, someone will steal it. Yeah. And that's not the reality. The reality is, Ideas are easy. The execution is hard. And knowing that you can, you know, post something that's the rough first draft of it. That's a Twitter joke version of this. And then decide, you know what? I like that. I want to do more. And these, these, um, the thing you fear of someone who's like refreshing Twitter, looking for an idea to steal. <laughs> I'm sure it's maybe happened once. It doesn't happen often. And again, the execution, your version should be better anyway. Like you're, you're, your job is to do a good job. I Can I tell you what's amazing about that that description as you just made it is that you used almost verbatim the exact words that Brad yeah. has used to me before, which is that ideas are cheap. It's the execution that's hard. And there was a real <laughs> sense of gratification in the sense like my two dads both agreeing on a, on a, on a phrase there. And I was like, this is amazing that you've both used the exact same, We're literally the, down to the word, the exact same way of saying that, that ideas are cheap is the execution that's hard. <laughs> Well, on that note, I will direct everyone to a couple different places online to enjoy more of Ryan's work. First of all, uh, get down and treat yourself to a couple of the big uh, the big trades for um, Squirrel Girl. They are a delight for all ages. I cannot recommend them enough. Another one, uh, if you know uh, quants.com, it's a Q, I don't even, I don't even want it. That's not the best one. Dinosaurcomics.com also works. Or Prove. Dino, how about that? That's easier. Good job, Dave. Who's a good host? It's me. <laughs> <laughs> so dinosaurcomics.com, ryannorth.ca will get you all sorts of projects. And then also howtoinventeverything.com. And then the new URL that I'll set up right now through uh, GoDaddy, which is ryannorthagreeswithbradgeiger.com. <laughs> That's right. You've been listening to Comic Lab, the show about making comics and making a living from comics. Your hosts have been Brad Geiger, the editor of webcomics.com and cartoonist of Evil Inc. at evil-comics.com. And Dave Kellett, co-director of Stripped and cartoonist of Sheldon at sheldoncomics.com and Drive at drivecomic.com. The Comic Lab theme song is used with permission from Andy Creighton at theworldrecord.net. And Comic Lab is made possible by your support on patreon.com slash comic lab. So we'll go ahead and say that twice. Patreon.com slash comic lab. <laughs>